Good. The sheer tonnage of antibiotics that is used in the world every year, I think, contributes to the problem of resistant bacteria in the community, which then becomes a problem in the hospital, which then becomes a problem in extended care facilities, and they're all inextricably linked. During the 1950s, animals started getting antibiotics too. The drugs not only curbed disease, but for reasons still not understood, they promoted growth. Today, half of all antibiotics used in the United States are used in animal feed. This little piggy will be fed penicillin and tetracycline before it goes to market. Even if you're a vegetarian, you get a dose. Antibiotics are also sprayed on fruits and vegetables. I can't think of a microbiologist that would say that the wide application of antibiotics will do anything but select for antibiotic-resistant organisms. And so that's a consequence. So if there are economic reasons for doing it, that may be what the public wants, but they also have to pay the consequences, which will be that those antibiotics may not be useful in the treatment of diseases uh, at some time in, in the fairly near future. The uh, lab has reported back to us on the second sample. Uh, it showed to be very resistant to the antibiotic he was on. Not only is it resistant to that antibiotic, it, it actually happens to be resistant to two of the other antibiotics we might use. Fortunately, though, we've got one left. Uh, it's an antibiotic called vancomycin. You ready for this? Vancomycin is considered the antibiotic of last resort. It is very potent, it's expensive, and it can be toxic. Elijah has to be given this medicine intravenously, and he will need to keep the IV in for five weeks, even after he goes home. A drastic change from pneumococcal infections of the past, when a teaspoon of pink medicine twice a day did the trick. There is a, a feeling, a, a deep concern about uh, uh, the availability of antibiotics to treat some of the resistant organisms. For some of the these major problems, there really is right now only one antibiotic that works. So there's a fear that if the resistance would develop to that particular antibiotic, then we would have a major problem on our hands. Staphylococcus aureus is the number one cause of hospital infections. In recent years, the increasing number of resistant strains has caused alarm. Among the Staph aureus strains in hospitals, many of them are resistant to everything except vancomycin. And so if vancomycin resistance moved into these strains, we could have untreatable strains of a very common resistant organism. That's a, that's a fear. Our hospital wards in the 1990s would look like the hospital wards in the 1930s, which was the pre-antibiotic era. There we had people dying of diseases such as uh, typhoid and tuberculosis and, and diphtheria and uh, pneumonia, uh, and we really didn't have much to give them in the way of therapy. The sun shines in Colorado almost every day in the year. It has happened. A patient in a Tokyo hospital developed a vancomycin-resistant staph infection. If the strain travels to the United States, as resistant strains have in the past, doctors will have very few options. One of the factors that has led to a global increase in resistance among bacteria is the fact that we have very mobile populations of people. You have international travel where you can literally take a resistant organism and transport it from one continent to the other in less than a day. So it's, it's a major problem around the world. Some resistant strains of disease are untreatable and potentially deadly. In 1994, a Korean woman flew from Baltimore to Chicago to Honolulu. Unknown to her, she had an active case of multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. After the woman died from the disease a month later, the passengers on the flights with her were tested. Fifteen tested positive for TB. These people may or may not develop active tuberculosis. If we've learned anything from the last 50 years of the antibiotic era, it's going, this race is going to continue. It may accelerate because we'll have new um, antibiotics as well as new classes of antibiotics in the future. But I think we'd be naive to think that just because we have a new class of antibiotics that's active against a currently resistant microorganism, that this process is going to stop. 
I don't believe that it will. With the vancomycin, we need to worry about things like the renal toxicity and the ototoxicity, and that's the, the real problem with the organisms that cause resistance. So we have a long haul like ahead of us is going to be going home on IV antibiotics. Essentially, we have very few options to offer him. You didn't even stop to say hi, did you? Yeah. Elijah is ready to go home. A nurse will visit him there to set up his IV. He will be monitored carefully to make sure the antibiotic is not damaging his kidneys. Six weeks later, Elijah's infection is finally gone. This part of South Dakota and the city of Lead is mining territory. People from all over the Black Hills have worked for the Homestake Mining Company, the longest continuously running gold mine in the world. It's a one-company town. Without Homestake, there would be no Lead. A lot of the miners are like third and fourth generation. Uh, their grandparents worked in the mine, and then their parents. And so it's like a big family. It takes six tons of rock to produce just one ounce of gold. Miners work six days a week digging, crushing, and grinding the ore to unlock the gold. If you grind it high enough, you're going to release the gold. Uh, it's not in the grain boundaries or anything like that. It's actually free gold. If you look at this table here, it's nothing more than an automated gold pan. It's doing the same thing the old timers did in the stream, except it's much more efficient and it's doing a lot faster and a lot more material. See that little golden streak coming down the table? That's the gold. But that streak is only half the gold in this ore. To extract the rest, the rubble goes to giant tanks of cyanide. Cyanide dissolves gold just like sugar dissolves in water. Uh, it makes a pure solution out of it. After the gold was extracted, the cyanide solution was dumped into the town's Whitewood Creek, killing everything in the water. For over a hundred years, the creek ran black. The Environmental Protection Agency gave Homestake one year to develop a plan to get the cyanide out of the creek. The mine managers weren't sure how to tackle the problem and keep the mine profitable. For the people in Leeds, South Dakota, profits for homestake meant jobs for the town. There's very few things besides cyanide that will dissolve gold, and they're a lot nastier than cyanide. Homestake's chief executive officer added a challenge. Make the stream pure enough for trout. Homestake hired a local biochemist, Jim Whitlock. And the problem was not money. They were willing to spend whatever it took. But the problem was there was no available technology to do this. There wasn't anything that they could take off the shelf. The fate of the mine, uh, everything was riding on it. Whitlock and his team decided to use their background in microbiology to try something new. We started with, with a simple knowledge that bacteria could tolerate cyanide, and we knew that some bacteria could tolerate a lot more cyanide than others. In fact, this was a a standard means for microbiologists to identify bacteria based on how much cyanide they could tolerate. And so we looked into that in depth and what we found out is that they actually broke the cyanide molecule into two parts and so that they could actually use it as a food source. We had a lot of apprehension for a long time. Uh, we had to convince our board of directors that this new process, this all new way of doing things would work. And we had to ask them for $10 million. 